welcome, my friends. I am Dave Champion. This is my co-host, Bill Carnes. And together we are totally, totally unprepared. unprepared. All right, we want to kick off the show today by talking about the fact that the completely inaptly named Patriot Act, which should be basically described as the, or, or named something akin to the Government Illegally Spying on Americans Act, um, that that is going to expire on June 1st. And uh, I think I speak for Bill and I when I say it would be an abomination to see it yet again renewed. Um, and to that end, tell us what's going on with uh, Rand Paul. Well, we record this show about 27 hours before it airs. True. Okay, 26, 27, 28 mm -hmm. hours before it airs. And uh, with that, right now as we record, uh, U.S. Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky, who is also a presidential candidate now, is on the Senate floor filibustering the Patriot Act renewal legislation, which they have just so much time that they can consider that specific piece of legislation before it's got to be crinkled up and pitched and then they've got to put a new one in there. Mm -hmm. And I know that Mitch McConnell, mm -hmm. who is the Senate Majority Leader and the other senator from Kentucky, mm -hmm. has proposed, I think it's a two-month extension because they've had otherwise important legislation they've been looking at. But right now, Rand Paul is, as we record this, has been on the floor for about three and a half hours now, uh, just not quite four hours actually, filibustering this by himself. And last time he filibustered, Dave, about a year and a half or so ago, um, Rand Paul did it and he spoke on the Constitution, he spoke on rights, he spoke on uh, everything that you and I have ever lived for and professed, and he did it for something like 18 straight hours in very uncomfortable shoes. Now, I don't have the name, I don't recall the name, there is another senator who said he's going to join Rand Paul in the effort to filibuster. Now, uh, let's talk about filibuster for a moment. Um, in the days of yore, filibuster could actually stop a bill from coming to a vote. Yes. Okay. Procedurally, that's pretty much dead now. Um, <clears throat> the party chieftains in the respective uh, houses have the ability to essentially shut down a filibuster. Uh, what a filibuster does today, really, is not prevent a vote, which it was could be correctly used at times in the past. Yes, the original uh, intent, if you will. Correct. Uh, today, what it is, is it's a means of getting the media involved and calling attention to an issue and getting Americans focused on sure. it. And that's really what Rand Paul is doing. Uh, he's calling attention to the fact, because Americans are so asleep at the wheel when it comes to the important things that are going on in this country. So what Rand Paul is doing is he's saying, hey, I'm, I'm gonna do this thing and because it's so unusual and rarely done, the media is going to give this attention. And maybe some Americans will go, oh. Which is exactly why you and I are talking what? about it right now. It's exactly <laughs> right. why we're talking about it. Now, call your congressmen. Call your senators. Tell them, look, you don't, you don't need to rail on the Patriot Act per se, uh, e even though you might feel like Bill and I do that it's, it's a heinous piece of legislation. You don't need to go into all that, okay? What you really need to do is tell them two things. <clears throat> it's time has run. Because remember, it's up for renewal. What the, this is what, the fifth renewal, something like that? Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, I think the last time it was a four or five year extension. Right, so you, you don't need to... The person you're talking to when you call your legislator's office doesn't really give a rat's behind about what you think about the Patriot Act. So two messages you want to give. That the Patriot Act has had its day. It has run its course. If we ever needed it, which is highly questionable, we don't need it anymore. If we haven't progressed as far as our intelligence and counterintelligence, the ability to allegedly protect ourselves, I'm sorry, protect ourselves from these alleged threats, okay? If we haven't developed some other way by now, okay, then the Patriot Act should go away anyway because the government's too stupid to handle anything. Okay? Really, what, what's happened, the Patriot Act was designed to be external to protect us internally, and what's happened is the executive branch through the president, through the NSA, through his spy agencies, DOJ, have misinterpreted it purposely to turn it inwards which I believe was the original intent behind that Of course that it was, law. yes. So, and we've had federal judge after federal judge after federal judge now say that the NSA spying, all of the data collection on Americans, all of that is against the law that was, it's against the Patriot Act, it was never intended in the Patriot Act, and it's unconstitutional, yep. 
but yet they still haven't forced them to stop doing it yet. They're referring it to Congress because of this renewal. Right. They want Congress to handle it. If not, then the courts might step in. But until the courts have a bunch of armed henchmen. Anyhow, that's a page. I think it's act, also but. important to have people understand, because I think there's a lot of people out there who believe the government. Okay, As I often say on my show, the government lies, lies all the time, and lies even when the truth would serve it well. I think that people really imagine that the Patriot Act is about protecting you and you and me. It's not. Yeah, that's why they named it that, so that you would <laughs> yes. think that that was a deal. And it's all about the government having more control over us. Yes, it's all about power and control. And it's about, as Bill says, about us. So tell them it's run its course. You want it to go away. Most importantly, for those of you who are mis who mistakenly buy into the government's story and believe it's it's propagandized purpose, which is to save us. If you believe that childish crap, I, I want to let you know that I think it took them all of eight months to use provisions of the Patriot Act against regular criminals that have nothing to do with terrorism. Yeah. Okay? So now, mind you, I think criminals, if they actually are engaged in criminal activity, they should be prosecuted and we should use the tools we have. But that wasn't what we were told about the Patriot Act, yep. right? Sold a different bill again. Right, it was to keep us safe from another 9-11. Well, uh, then why are you going after the average run-of-the-mill day-to-day criminals using the Patriot Act? Yeah. Yeah. This thing has been a scam from moment one. Call your congressman, call your senators, tell them, we're done. Stop it. That's right. Now, here's another thing, and this is a local issue where we live, as uh, we had a little bit of, uh, it seems like, excessive government control going on. This last weekend on our main highway, Highway 160 going through town, uh, where we had a, uh, the Sheriff's Department doing a, uh, a police check, basically a, a highway, a, checkpoint. highway checkpoint for, I think it was child seats, child safety seats or Car something. Car seats and seat belts. Car seats and seat belts, yes. Now, remember, let's talk about this for a moment. Um, it is our right to travel freely as Americans upon the roadways. Okay. Um, now, you're, you're already aware we are under quite a bit of a burden in the sense that we have to, um, when we're young, we have to go to a school and we have to learn how to drive and we have to take a test and we have to take a vision test. We have to you know, make sure that we're signed off and then we have to get a driver's license. We have to renew the driver's license, which is turning into now a national ID card and so forth. And we have to have, to have your vehicle properly registered and safety inspections and in some places smog inspections, all this stuff to drive around. Yeah. Okay? So, I don't know about you, but my view is um, have, corralling people on the highway so the government can get now again into your business is wholly unacceptable. And, and this is just something that started about 20 years ago. This wouldn't have been tolerated prior to our history. Uh, or I should say, in our history, this, if you go back far enough, this would not have been tolerated. Um, so now we have the, the government saying you, you have to be inconvenienced again. Inconvenienced, by the way, is the word the Supreme Court used when looking at these things. Again, okay? Um, and if you're not in compliance with whatever the checkpoint is where they corral you, um, and they can actually, while you pass through it, and I think this is the thing that makes it acceptable to a lot of people. Most of the people, they look into the car and they just wave them by. But that's not the game. It's pull over, okay? And they get you to pull off, and now they start the dialogue. Now they're looking to get into your car. Now they're looking to violate your rights. This is big government, police state, come to Perump. Now, some people support it because it was <laughs> car seats. It, it, it's, it, whether it's car seats, it, whether it's DUI, whether it's people trying to smuggle pieces to a, a nuclear bomb, whether it's too much dirt on your floorboard. Right. It's all the same net effect. And this, interestingly enough, is coming from a sheriff who promised us... During the campaign. During the campaign, there would be none of these. No None of these. No. And it's interesting. Um, I have... Uh, we have heard around town... Yes. ...that the assistant sheriff who's been out of work and on paid administrative leave pending an investigation for the last two and a half weeks... For trumped-up bullshit. Is, is the one who's responsible for this. 
Yeah. So, yeah. so let, me, let me tell the story. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, tell sto us. the story. The the whirly apologists, the ones who who want to somehow overlook or force away. It, it, it wasn't really Sharon violating her campaign promise. My girl would never do that. Those people now are saying, unbelievably, well, this was a Rick Marshall project. What they're claiming is that Rick Marshall, who used to secure a lot of the grant money for the sheriff's department, uh, that this was a Rick Marshall thing. He went out and he said, oh, checkpoints. And he applied for a grant and he got the money. And Sharon is only enacting the evil plan of Rick Marshall. When the truth is. Th the truth is, there's a gal who works for the county named Cooper. I forget her first name. Uh, she's in charge of grants for the county. And she solicited this grant and she got the money. Rick Marshall had nothing to do with it. And in fact, during his campaign, he said, I stand firmly against checkpoints. But you know what? Worley lied and lied and lied and lied and lied and lied until I wanted to vomit during the campaign. And her supporters lied and lied and lied. And they're doing the same thing now. This is what I want to get at is to the nuts and bolts of this. If you get the grant money to do a checkpoint and if you're sheriff and you firmly stand against it, you can return the grant money and say, no, thank you. Uh, right. You don't have to do what some administrative level person who's not, in, not even in your department in our, whether they were or not, you don't have to do what they did. They secure the funds. Okay, this is what you need to do. Here's the provisions, blah, blah, blah. You don't have to spend that money. You can send it back. Yeah. So, I mean, even were the lies true that this was a Rick Marshall grant money project, which is a lie, you whirly apologist lying through your teeth, um, even were this true, uh, Sharon was under no obligation to pull the trigger on it. Okay, so there's there's no way out of this. Your gal lied during the campaign, and she proved that she lied just the other day. You, you know what's interesting? But I've I know been, she's your gal, so it's all good if she lies. I've been driving for 30 years. I've only ever been subject to one DUI style setup checkpoint. Mm -hmm. In in Arizona, I've gone through a couple of the uh, the border patrol ones that they have. Right. Totally, totally, yeah, totally. But uh, one DUI checkpoint, and they asked, where are you coming from? I said, east. Where are you headed? I said, west. <laughs> right. Have you had anything to drink? Not today. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You know, it's like, it's none of your business. I had Anyhow. a bottle of water a few minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> and we All will right. be back right after these words. Um, oh, we're back. Sorry. Personal joke inside the studio. Um, <laughs> What the hell are we talking? Oh, we're back, and it's time for my segment. <laughs> Very smooth, was good Dave. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what is up with the craziness about and against immigrants? Now, before I begin, let me talk, let me mention that I see Barack Obama's um, executive action essentially destroying our border immigration enforcement as an impeachable offense because his job is to, um, to enforce the laws of the union. I mean, he, he takes an oath to, when he raises his hand to faithfully enforce the laws of the union, and he's not doing that. I think that's an impeachable offense. I want to say that because I want to separate th that wrongdoing from the issue of people in America being so freaked out over immigrants coming into the country. Now, first of all, let's go back historically. Um, if you're one of those people that are saying, oh my God, there's immigrants coming into America. Holy cow. Okay. Join your father, your grandfather, your great grandfather, your great great grandfather, and on back. That has been the cry of the American citizens from day one. Uh, here comes the immigrants. They're going to ruin our country. They're going to ruin our life. Now, some people will say, mistakenly, oh, you know, back in the old days, people would come from their country and, and they would want to assimilate. But these folks today, they don't want to assimilate into America. Okay, first of all, not true. Um, if you go back to the Irish and the Italian communities, one of the big objections that people who had got here before them, that's the key, right? It's, I'm here first, so now I get to say how it is, and then when the new people come, then I get to be all upset about it. Um, what 
the existing population base said about Irish and Italian and German immigrants when they came over is, the problem is they're not assimilating. They're maintaining their language. They're living in little clusters in their own neighborhoods, right? We, we got Chinatown, Little Italy, right? It's been going on since day one. And by the way, most of the time when you have people like Chinatown clustered together, when you have areas where it's just German, I'm going back 100 years, when you have neighborhoods that were just German and just Italian, it's because they, they needed to be next near one another to support one another from the prejudice and bigotry of the Americans that were already here. So it's kind of funny, it's like, you know, oh, you, you don't want to assimilate, you want to live in your own neighborhoods, but you don't want them living next to you. This, this is how it was 150 years ago, 100 years ago, 50 years ago. It's the same thing. Now, so what has happened in the past? Well, whether people assimilated instantly, which seems to be the requirement these days, which I think is asinine, um, they always assimilated by the first generation. So you had the parents who were off the boat, who spoke their language, who spoke very poor English or broken English, what have you, and people would get mad, the, the, the people who are already Americans would get mad about that and resentful about that. And, See, that's what makes these immigrants bad for America. And then their sons and daughters would be Americans just like you and me, okay? It's the way of it. Now, in every single period of time where there's been a large wave of immigrants, Americans have feared for their jobs. Now, I think when America had a smaller economy, less workers, uh, that was a more significant concern, okay? I'm not saying it, it should have been a great concern then. I'm not saying it shouldn't have be, be a basis of concern today. I'm saying I think in scale, it's not as great a concern today. When you have a nation of 330 million people, you know, a million people being added doesn't really make the, the huge difference in the job market, especially since they're not all going into the job market. However, I wonder, I wonder if the angst that we're hearing today from Americans about immigrants is because Americans no longer care to do a good job. They, for the most part, no longer have a standard of excellence. Now, I know this. People are probably mad at me. Oh, Dave, that's not true. You know what? Guess what I am? I'm a consumer. I am the customer of businesses. I was a customer of businesses all throughout Southern California. I, was, I am customers of business in Las Vegas. I am customer of businesses in Pahrump. And of course, by the World Wide Web, I am the customer of companies all over America. And guess what? There's almost no excellence. Everything is, give me as much money as I can get out of you, and in return, I'm gonna give you just the level of service that just, just, just barely manages to squeak above the line called acceptable. Yep. That's what I see. That's what I experience as a customer. And Bill and I have talked about on this show how when somebody does something exceptional, we wanna talk about it because there are so few who do. That's the thing, there's so few who do. And I have noticed the people who are trying to hit the mark of excellence in the marketplace are the people who are immigrants and their first generation kids. Those people who own businesses are, by what I see, they are truly trying to hit the standard of excellence. They are trying to excel. But people whose families have been in America five generations, they're just, you know, I'm just gonna go to work, put in my time, get my check, you know, I don't really care. So Bill, I know that you and I talked a little bit about this at lunch, and I know you have some thoughts on this, this excellence equation. So go ahead and share with me. Well, it used to be, bring us your poor, your tired, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free, blah, da, da. And now it seems it's, uh, bring your well-educated, your well-to-do, that have plenty of money that can um, immediately assimilate before we'll accept you. There is that. Right? And you're right, this has gone generation by generation. And, and I gotta say, I was talking with somebody just in this past week who brought up something very poignant. And that would be that, first of all, we, we have to realize that two of the bigger groups of immigrants that we get, culturally speaking, are Hispanic and Asian. Yep. Those are two of the biggest that come into the United States, statistically speaking. And 
you never seem to have too much trouble with a number of Asians coming into this country because oftentimes they come in here, they've already got some family here, they start working, they produce. A lot of people are, are afraid of Hispanics that come in because they have kids going to school and that ends up costing us more money and this, that, and the other. But I have to tell you. In other words, they think of Asians as contributors because they're normally higher educated and they immediately enter the workforce and they see Hispanics as mooching. Yes. Okay. You're right. I just want to clarify. That, that, that's, that's, that's taken out, uh, you know, not making any bones about it. Okay. It's taken out all the fluff. But you know, this, this friend of mine I was talking to, a friend and colleague of mine I was talking to, said, you know, I truly believe, and I believe this from the way he put it, he sold it very well, that the next generation of the middle class is going to be primarily Hispanic. Sure. Because we have Hispanics that come in here, into this country, that immigrate to the United States, that are willing to do all kinds of stuff that our lazy, fat asses are not willing to do ourselves. Right. We're not willing to do some of these jobs ourselves. And immigrants, particularly those who are Hispanic, will come in and they'll work two, three jobs, work the weekends, work five, six, seven days a week, and do all these different things, and then save this money and reinvest it in their own family and their own future. I mean, you and I eat regularly, virtually every week, at the same restaurant. Free show. It's a Mexican restaurant yes. that are, is owned by people who immigrated from Mexico. Yes. As a matter of fact, even the young help that is there, many of them were born in Mexico and came to the U.S. Yep. Now, you would know it so much by speaking to them because they speak completely fluent English as well as obviously completely fluent Spanish. Most of them accent-free. Most of them accent-free. And they also close their business for about four or five weeks a year, and they go back to Mexico for the holidays with their family that's still in the old country, if you will. No. And how many people are they employing? Oh, tons. And they're one of the examples where I said they're looking to excel. Yeah. Right? They're not looking to, to just have you have an okay experience. They're looking for you to walk out of there thrilled about what you yeah. just experienced. That's yeah. right. Yeah. You know, I, I had a, uh, I've gone through a couple of landscapers where I live. I have a lot of landscape to maintain, and I just can't stand it. You know, I, by the way, <laughs> teachable moments to parents. Don't do what my parents did. When my parents wanted to punish me, they'd tell me to go out and weed the garden right. as punishment. I hate gardening now. I, it was instilled as a, as, a, as a kid. You know, if you do something wrong, that's when you have to go out and garden or paint the fence or pick cherries off the cherry tree or something like that. That was punishment to me. Yeah. I still, anyhow, so I've gone through a couple of landscapers, but not the one I have now, but the one I had just before that. Hispanic you guy. You have to find one that needs to be punished and then assign them the job. <laughs> I guess. Hispanic guy. Uh, we actually met him at a, uh, a local gas station convenience store, just saw his landscaping truck, started chatting him up. And uh, he had a couple of other Hispanic guys working for him. They came over. They did a good job. It's just they disappeared for a couple of months during winter and still wanted to charge me for an annual fee when oh. I see it. That's, that's right, where right, right, right. this relationship came to an end. But one time his truck stalled and he had to have uh, his wife come over and get him. And she was driving a new H3 Hummer. So you know that they were making some good money. Oh, yeah. The guys that were working for him were being taken care of. And, and when she came over to it, she brought lunch for everybody. So, you know, I have to say, you know, applaud to you. I'm happy paying the rate that I'm paying to you to get my landscaping done. And of all the other customers you have that are also happy to do that, your wife's driving around in a brand new H3. And you've got two or three employees. As a matter of fact, he had a couple of trucks running around. So he actually had about a half a dozen employees. And I doubt he was financing his equipment. He's probably buying it in cash, yeah, sure. helping out with the local economy. Everybody's buying things locally. Mm -hmm. Good on you. You know, you know that years ago, before I came to Perum, um, I was very, very ill. Um, and the doctor... Were you talking about your... No, no, not, not mentally, physically. No, I meant... Oh, oh yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, and, and the doctor, that <laughs> my, my primary care physician, um, things were going downhill fast and nothing was changing. Uh, and I, he, I couldn't seem to get him focused on doing anything. He'd send me out for this test, send me out for that test. In the meanwhile, uh, I, I think I'm in trouble, right? Really serious physical trouble. Well, he goes on vacation, and I get a Chinese doctor. Okay. Um, kind of trippy, like 6'5". Speaks, wow. Right, speaks with the Chinese, still with the accent, right? And he says, he looks at my file, he says, do you have a few minutes? So he's reading through the file, he says... I don't mean to alarm you, but I think if we don't figure out what's wrong with you, there's a significant chance you may die. Like, thank you! Thank you! <laughs> and, and then from there on, things started to change. Now, before we go into the break, I do want, we talked about excellence. Yes. Um, so I want to give a shout out to Fit for 10 Gym. 
Um, I wasn't sure about those guys when they first came to town because they're a big corporation um, and $10 a month, right? Okay, I was wrong. <laughs> okay. They're doing a splendid job. I have a membership there. They're absolutely awesome. They take great care of their customers. Uh, and no, by the way, I'm not getting anything in. I'm just telling you the truth. Um, and they have new equipment, which is unheard of in Pahrump. Okay, they've got a bunch of new equipment. So by all means, if you're looking to get fit, which we would recommend, yes, uh, go Where are to they? Fit for Ten near the Goodwill or something. I don't know how were they. Okay, on Loop Road. On Loop Road. On Loop Road, and we'll be back. Welcome back. It's time for a hat trick in my next segment coming up. You know what really grinds my gears? It's this hat trick trifecta that happened a couple days ago this week on Tuesday. We had three pretty big deals that came out as far as I could see it. The first of which, the Boy Scouts came out and said, no more water guns involved in any sort of Boy Scout related activities because it's not nice to point a firearm at somebody. Hey news, Boy Scouts, couple of things. You happen to have a shooting merit badge. And in there you learn the definition of a firearm. And if you press a little trigger and water comes out, that's not a firearm. So one does not equal the other. You're silly. And we'll talk more about this in a second. Second, that same day, the Girl Scouts came out. And they decided that what they're going to do now is accept transgendered children, basically little boys, who feel like maybe they're little girls. And that's okay. Dave and I are gonna talk about this in a little <laughs> bit. We chatted about it at lunch and it was a great conversation. I hope to resurrect this. The third one, which is probably the most egregious garbage that I could imagine that the city council of Los Angeles could do this year. They raised the minimum wage standard in the city of Los Angeles to $15 an hour so that you could make a living wage through a minimum wage job. Dave, we're gonna talk just a little bit about these things. Let's start with the minimum wage aspect, work our way backwards uh -huh. with these. <laughs> okay, you're gonna save the ugly for last? Yeah, okay. Look, so the minimum wage in Los Angeles at 15 bucks an hour. First of all, in LA, 15 bucks is probably not much of a living wage. That's but right. I gotta say, why stop at 15? Why not go to 25? Hell, why not make it 50? At $15 an hour, some of the business owners are gonna be paying their employees more than what they take home mm -hmm. in some of these cases. And it's probably going, not gonna affect too many businesses that are in operation now, more so. It's gonna stifle new businesses coming in, new employers, and eventually that's gonna trickle down to unemployment. And if they don't erase that or find a fix for it, a Detroit-style setting coming over on the West Coast. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right about the Detroit parallel. Um, but they sort of have the same situation the U.S. government does with, uh, with being the world's reserve currency. In other words, they can cheat a lot and not feel the effects. And then that's what L.A.'s been doing because, uh, I don't want to say L.A. specifically, Southern California, the greater Los Angeles area. Um, they got a lot of mega corporations, and mega corporations, as you know, they, they just can't move on a dime. So you say something like this, you have to pay your employees a minimum of this. Uh, you take, say, Boeing as an example. Not that they're much concerned with paying people $15 an hour. They have a lot of professionals working there. But nevertheless, you take a company like Boeing. Um, for them to move out is somewhere between a seven to 10 year project for them to move out. Um, so that's a lot of work and it's something that the government's gonna have to make it really bad before they do that. Well, yeah, they're turning up the heat on those frogs. They really are. Oh, of course they with, are. With all the different legislation that they have, the higher tax they have, and they're incrementally making it a little bit more difficult. They have to continue to revamp their system. Yep. And in the case of Boeing, that allows Airbus, which is co-opted by a bunch of European governments, yep. to really come in and make a difference and eventually start putting Boeing out of business. Uh, yeah, and then eventually that kind of thing will happen. But now, you'll notice nobody's building new facilities in SoCal. No, okay. nobody is. There's no construction there. Then you have, uh, we talked about this a little bit at lunch, a lot of businesses in California are sort of tailored to that, that culture. You know, the surfing scene, the entertainment industry, the, how people in the L.A. area perceive The flashy, the wow. How they perceive the, themselves, yeah. yeah. So, so a lot of these businesses, even if they're small, mid-sized companies, if they're playing to the public, okay, 
they cannot just shut down and go someplace else because their formula wouldn't work right. outside that mindset. Um, so really, the, the, the city of Los Angeles and some of these other governments outside the city, they are relying on the fact that, that let me rephrase this, that they are sorry, relying on the fact they're almost using it as extortion that these businesses simply cannot pick up and leave. Well, and, and let's look at it like this. There's a number of businesses that already pay their employees 15 bucks an hour or more in LA. It's not going to affect them. What's really going to affect you is the everyday things. If you want to go get some fast food or if you want to go to the grocery store mm -hmm. or any convenience store, <coughs> gasoline, gas station attendants, people that work in convenience stores are generally not making 15 bucks an hour. The smaller restaurants, they're not making 15 bucks an hour. Um, and who knows, because in a lot of places, the restaurant industry can actually pay their servers and their bartenders less than minimum wage because they work on tips. I don't know if there's a provision in this new ordinance or not. We'll find out. Well, I can tell you that in California, servers and bartenders must be paid at least minimum wage and then tips. Okay, there you um, are. But when you talk about things like McDonald's, as an example, um, fast food, um, as a test bed, McDonald's Canada just bought 3,500 of these very graphic user interface things that are t meant to take the place of human beings when you step into... They're testing them up there where it's going to be less... They're going to be testing them in L.A. in no time at all. <laughs> That's what you I'm talking about. All right, I know you've uh, got some other things to get Yeah, through. let's actually talk about the Girl Scouts issue before we hit the Boy Scouts issue. We're going to go in reverse order. Where the Girl Scouts have said we're going to allow transgender children into the Girl Scouts. Okay. And this is how I see it. The Girl Scouts have been around for 103 years. Mm -hmm. And the idea of really a third gender, boys, girls, and transgender. Now, not to be confused with transsexual. Transgender is more up here, mm -hmm. where transsexual is more libido related. So if you have, and there are a lot of adults now. He said libido. Who felt, as a matter of fact, you and I know. Beep that out. Uh, <laughs> you and I felt, uh, or felt, you and I know a transgendered woman. Start off as a man, now a woman. And, uh, and she's completely awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Lives in Southern California. And uh, I put this post on my Facebook page. She had a, and she said, you know, look, when I was in the Boy Scouts, mm -hmm. I felt like a square peg in a round hole. And I understand that. I totally understand it's, that. It's so wrong. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, we're talking about blocks. Uh, so what we have here is we have what's really been... Lubrication helps that. What's really been kind of pushed into society in just the last few years is that the idea of this third gender, which has otherwise been kind of kept suppressed, is now being allowed to flourish. And it's coming along pretty quickly, and a lot of people have had a hard time grabbing onto it. So it'll be interesting to see how the Girl Scouts... Uh, kind of are affected on a ground level, on a local level. Like in Southern California, it might go fine. In the Bible Belt, it might not. It'll be interesting to see how this goes. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know my view on what I consider to be bigots. I, I have, I don't care, okay? You don't have... I don't care. I How mean, should we? T well, <laughs> I'm trying to relive our lunch conversation, which got to be, I'm trying to be very little... animated. And, I, and, and Dave is getting really worked up, and his head's turning red. And I'm like, we got to do this on the show. Like, this is awesome, man. So, all right. Uh, my view is, and I'm going to repeat it a little more calmly. Than <laughs> now that you've had a chance to digest, that's right, it, Cos. Oh. Your thoughts. <laughs> okay, my thing is this. Um, <laughs> When a bigot speaks, hey, get your pen out. When a bigot speaks, I could give a rat's ass what they have to say. As far as I'm concerned, shut the hell up. I don't want to hear it. You know, the, everybody has an opinion. No, if you're a bigot in Dave Champion's world, you don't have a fucking opinion. That's the way that goes, okay? So I, I, I just, when I, when I hear like these bigots get, you know, well, you know, it, 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 no. <laughs> I'm looking at Dave like, yeah, crank it up. Come on, Dave. Uh, this is a hot button for me. I can't tolerate bigotry. Um, and and a, a quick little verbal definition of bigotry in my mind. When you want to say that what somebody else is doing is bad or wrong and prevent them from participating in programs, uh, organizations, etc., when them being there harms no one, that to me, or deprive them of some right, such as marriage, to me, that's bigotry. They're harming no one. Let them live their life. You live your life. Okay, and I get that. Yeah. However, what we're looking at here is we also can have people with ulterior motives. So you say harm no one. Imagine you get some little boy that decides, you know what? I got nothing better to do. 
I want to go and join the Girl Scouts and play transgender. It's like that movie where the two high school football boys decide that they want to go to cheerleading camp and they're going to play gay so they can scam on girls. I, I missed that this one. Is, <laughs> this, this is another version of that. So you never know. We'll see what happens. And the Girl Scouts might have some liability there. Yeah, we'll, time will tell. By the way, my, my personal paradigm, I, I don't know. Well, time will tell. You're right. I don't know any guy, like a heterosexual guy, Who's going to be like, oh, let, let me pretend to be transgender? I mean, n I, that doesn't really play. I mean, would you? No, but okay. that doesn't mean that. I mean, no. you and I are the, not the only two guys in this country. You no. know, there's some 150 million of us, and many of them are within the age to join. Now, we've got about three minutes left. Let's talk about the Boy Scouts now. Okay. Where they say no more water guns at uh. any sort of Boy Scout events because pointing a firearm at somebody is not nice. Now, I was a Boy Scout. And I got to tell you, I, I was actually the best shooter in my troop. That's actually where I learned to shoot. Oh. Was 22 rifles at little plastic skeets at summer camp. Mine was archery. OK, there you go. Uh, so as good as you are as an archer, I was good as, as a shooter. And they still have a shooting merit badge. But now nothing that even resembles a gun. And you know we've had these issues where the kid like ate his sandwich or popped hard or whatever it is into the shape <laughs> of a gun and got suspended. suspended yeah. In Nevada, the state legislature is entertaining legislation that would protect those kids from yeah. that sort of stupidity. And I gotta tell you, when I go out and I water my yard or my garden, I have a hose adapter and a little squeeze mechanism that resembles a gun. Right, right, right. So it, would that be illegal at some sort of a Boy Scouting event if somebody needed to, you know, if it was a car wash? How are the Boy Scouts gonna do a car wash because the nozzle on the hose resembles a gun and water comes out? Stupidity. Now, I, I'm gonna sort of trade on, on stereotypes for a minute just for the sake of humor. Um, you remember, what was it, a year ago? year and a half ago, there was all this drama in the press because the Boy Scouts were considering allowing gay boys to participate in the scouting program. Mm -hmm. Well, explain something to me. Why was there all the pushback against having a boy who's gay in the Boy Scouts? Why was all the pushback against, but it's fine to say, no water, can't shoot water, people. <laughs> I mean, I mean, like, oh, what? You're pushing back against gay scouts, but you support you can't squirt a boy with a squirt gun? Yeah, and, and, Unbelievably you know, talk ignorant. Of, talk about an opportunity, in this case for the Boy Scouts, to say, look, we don't have a problem with water guns because they're fun. They're designed for kids to have fun. And they understand we teach them through our programs that it's not an actual firearm. We have a shooting merit badge that helps the kids to understand this. It's all part of our program. We get that it's not a real gun, and we're not gonna be sucked into the stupidity that if it shoots water and you're at some one of the other kids' pools or at a community pool, and you're playing within the troop and there's a water gun or a, a, a water blaster, it's okay, because it's not an actually a gun. What if they those big things that pump the water from the pool? Yeah, yeah, exactly, the super it's, soakers. It's I mean, what a great opportunity when somebody says, you know, well, why, why are you allowing this? Well, because the boys that are part of this organization are smart enough to know the difference and between squirting water and fun. shooting bullets. Yeah. They're smart enough to know the difference between squirting a squirt gun and shooting a firearm. I wonder, Our boys are just that smart. What I wonder they if they that? allow laser tag and paintball. Well, obviously they couldn't. We'll be right back after we collect our <laughs> thoughts. <laughs> Welcome back. Today, we are going to go through our viewer email bag. You can always send us an email. It's billanddaveshow at gmail.com. You can also go on to our website and find that there. That is totallyunprepared.info. And you can watch, stream, download any of the shows that we've got. Um, it goes to the streams directly to the ones that we've got on YouTube. You can just go there and find them directly. And last week, during my rant, we talked about pet owners, female pet owners, claiming Mother's Day. Yes. And I don't know any male pet owners that claim Father's Day. So we got a couple of emails on that. Not the least of which came from the folks who operate West Star Animal Rescue here in town. Yes, who, by the way, are awesome, awesome people, and they provide an awesome function. And if you need a pet, uh, whether you're looking for a cat, a dog, uh, please go see my friend Terry, who runs West Star. Um, it's getting an animal from a no-kill shelter is, at least in my opinion, really where it's at. Yeah, and, and I have more to say on that as soon as I get into this. Yeah. Now, Terry sent an email and invited me to come over Tuesday nights, 6 o'clock, to watch the Dave Champion Show here on KPVM, 
while his wife makes dinner and a cat can lay in my lap and I can assimilate and hang out with the cat and all that other good stuff so I could like cats. Now, just to tell you, by the way, I should interrupt, Terry and Carolyn are not married. Oh, I'm, my mistake, I'm oh, sorry. But I have to say, I've had cats before and I've loved cats before and it's just, my dog is not that big a deal, doesn't much care for cats. So Terry said, bring the dog over to West Star We'll assimilate the dog. There's all kinds of animals. <laughs> She'll end up loving the, the animals. After and everything. A after a month, everything will be great. Okay, well, here's something you don't know, Terry. My dog came from Westar. <laughs> I got her from you. She lived there for two years, and she hates cats. <laughs> However, I also have to say that. So a little bit of gotcha on that one. <laughs> I love Westar. Great people, great facility, yes, and... A couple of times a year, uh, my girlfriend and I will go and we'll bring over food and we'll donate dog food to them. Uh, last time we did was about five or six months ago. We took 200 pounds of dry dog food and donated it to them. And as a matter of fact, we're probably going to do at least another 100 pounds now. As a matter of fact, another matter of fact, I was just over at our local Home Depot at Walmart mm -hmm. this week. They have 50 pound bags of Old Roy dog food for $18.73. Wow. So I'm gonna go over there and buy two, maybe three, maybe even four of those and take them over there. 100, maybe 200 pounds of dog food I'm gonna have over to them first part of the week once the next check comes in and clears. And we're gonna go over there and we're gonna help take care of you guys over at West Star again. So thank you very much. But and just so you know, <laughs> little gotcha. <laughs> yeah, just so you know, Tuesday nights I have a standing meeting, so I appreciate the invitation. I really do. By um, the way, Terry, I, you know, in reading that email that you sent, I, I'd never heard you be so damn funny. Yeah, it was a very <laughs> funny email, and we went through the whole thing at lunch. It was great. Thank you very much. Um, then we have another uh, viewer who actually wrote us a letter, wrote, actually wrote us a letter on pink note paper here, Yes. that uh, is about people who bring their dogs into some of the local stores. And is she the only one who goes wacko when people bring dogs into stores? <laughs> and does that mean now that she could bring one of her cats? Now, I have to say, guilty is charged. I have three dogs mm -hmm. and occasionally, Rarely, I should say. Occasionally, I'll take them with me to, like, say, Home Depot or something. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, I had uh, my old dog that hates cats that came from Westar that is handicapped. She only has a use of three legs. And I took her into Home Depot just a couple of weeks ago. I happened to, I was taken over to a friend's house. Matter of fact, the people that took her to Westar uh, moved back into town, and they are relatives of a friend of mine, so I took them over to, to see the dog. They hadn't seen it in about eight years. Huh? So, and I had to stop at Home Depot to grab some stuff on the way and on the way back. So she got a couple of trips in and out. Uh, I got a lab who's been to uh, Home Depot, and I have another little pit that's been in there. Um, again, each one of them gets to go to Home Depot, maybe about once a year or something. <laughs> and uh, they're all great, well-behaved dogs. If they weren't, I wouldn't take them out of the house. And I've never been to a local store that anybody brought their dog that wasn't a nice, polite, friendly dog. People don't tend to bring out these rabid killer beasts no, out of the house and go don't. to a store. Now, your dogs are all short hair. Um, uh, relatively. Relatively yes. short hair. Um, as you know, mine are both <laughs> full of hair. Um, and like yours, very loving, very well-mannered. Uh, the worst thing they would ever do would be sniff people or lick them. Uh, and but I, I would not take them into a public place because I know, for instance, and I'm sure you've, even with your shorter hair dogs, you've experienced this. You know, I'll come around the corner. It's, it's what I call a dead mouse laying on the carpet. It's, it's a big wad of hair, you know, that fell off one of the dogs. And I mean, they get brushed regularly. It happens anyway, though. I, I would never want to leave that sort of thing behind because I brought my dogs into a business. So because my dogs are long haired dogs, I don't. That said, personally, I have one objection, and it's not to Home Depot, it's not to Walmart. I am an animal lover, all ways, shapes, forms. I love animals. Um, right next to the mashed potatoes. That, oh, <laughs> we'll funny that, story. We should tell we'll that story, <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, the only objection I have is in a place that serves food. Yeah, you know, a, either a restaurant or a grocery store yeah. or something like that. And, and yeah, yeah I, I noticed that people uh, will bring non-service dogs into a restaurant. It's like really, you know, I don't really want. Yeah, especially if they feed them at the table. Oh, wow. By the way, I, 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 don't, I don't allow pets, my pets, anywhere near the kitchen mm -hmm. at any time. And I don't allow them near us when we're eating. I don't want a dog sitting there begging 
while I'm eating for right, human right. food. Uh, my dogs, they're on a, a pretty strict diet. We, we regulate their intake. They all have excellent body weight. They're not a bunch of fat, lazy American dogs mm -hmm. uh, like fat, lazy American people are sometimes. And the, our vet literally praises us for keeping our dogs healthy with what we feed them, how we feed them, when we feed them, and how much we feed them. Yeah. And they're supplemented. They're all very, very healthy dogs. Now, this story. When I first met Bill, <laughs> can I tell this? <laughs> Let me set it up. Okay, though. go ahead. When I first met Bill, I didn't live out here. It was years before I moved out here. It's a couple of years. Yeah, before, yeah. Right? And and I was dating a great gal from Southern California, who was to call her an animal lover is not even. We're, we're falling way short. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I mean, like psychotic about about uh, yeah, an, animals, right? You stepped on a cockroach. Yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You did. You didn't catch the spider and put the spider outside. Yeah. yeah. All right, so we're in a restaurant, and she's going on about this animal thing. So I'm sitting there, and I'm agreeing with her. And I said, you know what? I have to tell you, <laughs> I love animals the way you do. And there is room for all of God's creatures. And she started to get this beautiful glow on her face until I said, right next to the mashed potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> and this instant look of ooh, horror came across her face. <laughs> and here's her man at the time, Dave, is sitting there. And he busted up laughing so hard. Food's coming out of his teeth. <laughs> I don't think she, she appreciated the lack of support when I set her that, up with that one. That was just... I mean, that wow. was wonderful timing. It, it worked was. out. It would. And, and I, honestly, I stole that from Sarah Palin, who actually had it in her book, Going Rogue, at the time. Oh, okay. It had just come out. There's room for all of God's creatures right next to the mashed potatoes. Go, Sarah Palin. That was great, <laughs> yes. So in, in response to this, um, our, our viewer asked, does that mean I can take my cats into stores? If you want to stuff your cat in your little purse or your cat tote or whatever, yeah. why not? It, you know, Dave... When you're out, say you go to one of the stores where, like a home, let's just stick with Home Depot since that's my experience, and you have seen somebody else with their dog there, what do you do? Um, either nothing, or if like we're both kind of like stopped at the same place looking at something, I'll like go ahead, hide to the dog. Pet the dog, right? and yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so my dog, my older dog, um, that is the handicap one, she is sweet as a day is long unless you introduce a cat. By the way, it's funny. Uh, she is handicapped. So this could be the problem, taking the cat in with it when a dog's yeah, in there, right? Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so she doesn't have the use of her left rear leg. She can use it, but doesn't due to an injury when she was young. We got the surgery and the rehab due to unbelievable amounts of money, but still she hasn't used it in so long she chooses not to. Um, there's ways we can get her to use it, and we try, and it's coming along more. She's older. Anyhow, she's a beautiful dog. And, um, you know, she's what you would call a blue pit. She's got the dark nose and white with the, uh, the gray big patches on her. Oh. And, uh, she's you know, a sweetheart. Yeah, she's an absolute loving dog. And, uh, you know, she'll give you a little lick and sniff, sniff, won't jump on you, none of that. And then within a couple of seconds, she's done. She wants to sniff around the store or somewhere else. And uh, I have a lot of people, oh, she's so beautiful. Oh, did you know she's limp? Yeah, I know she's limping. I actually just tell people now, <laughs> if you see her, I just tell people, instead of going into the long store, I just say, it's a birth defect. She's been like that forever. I think when you're in a store and somebody says, you know, your dog is limping, you should go, really? I've done that before, too. <laughs> but here's the funny story, Dave. I actually have told people before, like, we'll take her to the park for an event. Right. You know, there's events in town all the time. There's the big park. People bring their dogs, and it's welcome. Yeah. Never been in trouble out there. And uh, I told people before, she's a Michael Vick rescue dog. <laughs> and she's sweet as the day is long. Yes, that is. is paralysis from an injury when she was in that kennel. And she's the sweetest dog in the world unless she hears that one word, which is her basic command word to attack. So then you're seeing people that are perplexed like, well, what's the word? But they don't want to ask what the word is because there's the dog. They'll go off. They just heard that. And it's just my way of messing with people. So if you ever see me and I'm doing that to somebody, just laugh inside because they haven't seen this episode. That's great. <laughs> so, yeah, if you want to bring your cat or your hamsters, I mean, bring be within reason. Could you imagine somebody bringing their pet iguana? 
Right on. In on a leash. See, I, That'd be kind of cool. I, I, yeah, I, you know, the <laughs> your llama, you know. Take or, the llama out of the, yeah, you know, the truck. The, you know, the blue and gold macaw on the shoulder, you know. And there is the guy in town that has his goat that takes his goat everywhere. Yes, you've seen that guy. Truck. Yeah, 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 he has his goat in the back of his truck. They are kindred spirits. This man and his goat are absolute kindred spirits. He has, a, he has this uh, blue Chevy pickup. It's probably from the mid 90s or so, late 80s, mid 90s. And uh, he's always got his goat. He's always at the events at the park. And uh, I see him over at the, the Albertsons in that shopping center pretty regularly. Oh, yeah. 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 He's got so, his goat. And, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, I, I think that's one of the things that people look forward to also when they live in a more rural community, um, such as Pahrump. Um, they, they, I think they, one of the things they have an expectation of is that people are going to be relaxed about that yeah. kind of thing. You get a little bit of more freedom, a little more yeah. liberty. People gotcha. aren't so uptight. Try this in New York City. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's yeah. kind of the difference. You, you're a dog walker there and picking up poo. By the way, uh, again, I want to say thank you to West, our both of us yes, do. Absolutely. I am going to take a donation over there, and I encourage anybody else, if you want to take advantage, go eat some cat food or some dog food, especially with this old Roy sale. It's not the highest quality food, but it's bulk, which they need. And they're closed Tuesdays, Mondays and Tuesdays. Okay, at West So Star. don't, wait, don't go run over there thinking you're going to help on Monday. There's, there's also yeah. the Nye County Animal Shelter that you could donate to as well. So either of those are, are good. I'm a big supporter of West Star, so if anybody wants to go get it, we support it. And Dave, thanks, man. We'll see Thank you, you for being here. Uh, next week. Bye-bye.